Hey, everybody. Welcome to Episode 7 in our ongoing Experts Assessment Series. We've got a great panel lined up today. And before we jump into the session, let's go over a couple of housekeeping items. First, if you can go to slido.com and enter the code seen on the screen, we want to keep this as interactive as possible. So we've set up a poll for today's discussion. Also, please let us know where you're coming from in the chat. Just say hi and hello. And lastly, if you have questions throughout the session, please drop those in chat as well. And we will try to get to as many of those as we can in our Q&A portion. So with that, let me turn it over to Peter Angerstern, who's going to be moderating today's session. Peter. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And my name is Peter Angerstern. As, as Chris said, I'm the chairman of the IFMA Board of Directors. And on the daily level, uh, I'm the chief strategy officer at Planon. Uh, if you don't know Planon, I can say we are a global leader in facility and real estate management software solutions. And I'll be your host for today's session. So um, this is really a, a, a webinar that is under the headline, The Future of Work Post-COVID-19, The Experts Assessment. And today's session is going to be on technology transforming the workplace experience. The idea behind the series of uh, IFMA Experts Assessments webinars is to focus on the research that IFMA has provided and bring you close to the experts and, and the specialists uh, who can share some of the insights and conclusions from the surveys. This is the seventh episode of the series, and you can find a recording of all the previous sessions at the IFMA website on, or on YouTube. Uh, there will be a link to that in the show notes. Um, the Slido poll that Chris already mentioned, that's going to be open uh, for uh, five minutes more. Uh, we will really appreciate uh, your input to this. Uh, which assumptions did the COVID-19 pandemic give your organization the greatest pause and cause to rethink? And with assumptions, we are talking about um, anything that, that, that will be relevant for your organization, how you work, uh, how you connect with your colleagues, um, leadership uh, approach, uh, those types of things that, 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 that are some of the things that, that may have changed uh, during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The uh, experts assessment study took place over the summer last year and was released um, in October 2020. This was really the first survey of its kind within the FM industry and also the first survey that IFMA has ever used using subject matter experts uh, in terms of understanding the consequences that are coming from the global uh, pandemic. Um, it, we also realized that it is uh, now um, almost a year old uh, research and especially during the, uh, the last year, things are changing very rapidly at the moment. And, uh, and therefore, uh, I think it's, it's, it's really great that we have uh, such an experienced panel uh, with us today as we have, uh, because uh, I think we need to make sure that, that the, uh, the conclusions that are drawn from the survey are, of course, up to date and relevant in, in today's environment, especially since uh, the speed of change has increased tremendously over the past uh, year or 18 months, really. Um, the survey report is available on the IFMA site, website also, and, and the executive summary is uh, free for download. So today we have a very experienced and very specialized international panel with us uh, today. And I will ask each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and just explain a little bit about their background and why uh, they are relevant to this particular discussion around workplace technology and, and experience. So uh, let me just call on our first panelist, and that is Jos Duchamp. Jos, will you introduce yourself, please? Uh, I'm uh, Jos Duchamp. I'm a managing director of uh, Procols Group, um, and I'm also a member of the global board of IFMA. I have a background as a construction engineer, but I'm in the facilities management business now for 25 years. Uh, I'm based in Belgium, but uh, our teams are involved in cross-border projects in Europe. Um, Procos Group is a consultant in uh, facilities management and workplace design, and we're also a business partner of, uh, of Archibus. Um, with our Smart at Work uh, concept, we want, um, we want to provide the employees of our clients a better day on the job. Uh, and uh, our challenge is also to integrate technology but on a human scale. 
And so I'm looking forward to have an interesting session and open for your comments and remarks. Thank you, Jos. Uh, next up, we have uh, Katrine Sinnergaard Byrne. Katrine, will you introduce yourself, please? Yes, hello, and thank you for having me on the panel today. Um, looking forward to our discussions. I am a lawyer. I'm based in Denmark. I specialized in employment law, labor law, and data protection. But I'm also the uh, co-founder of the, uh, the Think Do Tank, the non-for-profit organization called dataethics.eu. I can highly recommend to visit the website where you can also find various tools that has been developed to kind of focusing on the data ethic, ethical side of, of data processing. But in my, my law firm, I provide services and, and legal advice to companies primarily um, within data protection and employment law. And I, I just, I mean, I love the crossover between work uh, employees and and the uh, the privacy and protection of data in that connection. So um, looking forward to it. Thank you, Katrina. Next up, we have Brooke Potter. Brooke, if you can introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Brooke Potter uh, with Schneider Electric, and I'm based here in Boston in the U.S. Uh, I'm the director of product management for what we call our smart workplace solutions. That includes uh, a product called Workplace Advisor, which is a workplace analytics SaaS offer as well as our occupant app solution, which is called the Engage Enterprise app. Uh, I have a long history working in the AEC building industry. Uh, prior to Schneider, I spent many years at design software maker Autodesk, uh, helping them to develop what we would call industry-leading BIM solutions, including the Revit architecture product, and then more recently, a mobile ticketing solution called BIM 360 Ops. Uh, very much looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Brooke. And then we have Jesper Koch. Jesper, if you could also introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Jesper, and I've been in the uh, audio industry for more than 20 years. Uh, I know a lot about psychoacoustics and uh, how the human brain reacts to, uh, to different uh, sound environments. Uh, last many years, I've worked with uh, professional headsets uh, for, for gamers and for enterprise solutions, and uh, lately also video solutions. So uh, I'm, the, I'm the techie dude. <laughs> Thanks, Jesper. And then we have uh, Nadim Stop, and Nadim is uh, is a, a, a real uh, specialist in the prop tech environment. Nadim, if you can introduce yourself, please. <laughs> Thanks for that, Peter. Yeah, my name is Nadim Stop. I'm the managing director of Prop Tech Denmark. I also sit on the board of the European Prop Tech Association and the executive committee for ULI here in Denmark. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I, I specialize in prop tech and, and my job is to effectively help uh, drive an agenda of innovation within uh, the uh, with, with players and operators, owners uh, of real estate. Um, and, you know, very much focused on the innovation and very much focused on a design driven user centric approach to harnessing the capacity and capabilities of real estate uh, for the end user. Perfect. And then uh, last but certainly not least, we have Jeffrey Saunders. Jeff, if you could also introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Jeff Saunders here. I'm the CEO at Nordic Foresight, and I help develop and uh, facilitate the experts assessment survey and have been presenting the findings from, from many of the, uh, the webinars that we've held on the event. So I'm looking forward to the discussions, teeing up uh, some of the conversations from the study, and then uh, participating in the debate with the panelists that we have here today. Right. Thank you, uh, Jeff, and, and welcome to the entire panel. It's it's rare that we have such a big panel, but also such a specialized and experienced panel. So I think that will uh, really uh, provide some for, for some good discussions uh, and also input. Uh, for all the participants, uh, please uh, use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen where you can uh, provide comments or questions remarks, anecdotes, anything you want to share uh, with us uh, and, and with the panel especially. So uh, with today's topic, we'll focus on getting some of these expert views on how organizations are investing in workplace technologies related to experience and how it impacts on uh, property, uh, real estate, facility management, strategy settings of the organization, the services offered, budget, requirements, skills requirements, and those types of things. But in the beginning of today's session, we asked a question on Slido, which assumptions did the COVID-19 pandemic give your organization the greatest pause and cause to rethink? 
Uh, Ashley, can you share with us some of the results that are coming out from the word cloud on this, if we have any? There's one, there was one input, the adaptability of workers. All right, um, yeah, that's a statement. Let's see, there might be a few others coming in, but but let's let's just take the adaptability of workers because that whole adaptability issue is, is pretty key. And I think we've all had to adapt to the situation during the COVID-19 lockdown and, and our uh, ability to work from home. Uh, Yas, what is your comment on on our uh, ability to adapt? But I, I think this already gives gives for me the key of the entire solution. It's about the humans, human beings. Uh, if we talk about technology, I think there's a lot of technology available. If we talk about technology in the workspace, there's a lot of technology available in the workspace but we need to to make it uh, let's say uh, user friendly and to see how people in organizations are able to adapt and to make this technology as an added value for uh, for their work and for uh, for connecting to each other uh, i think the the adaptability of of the workers is the is for me the cornerstone of the let's say of the new normal and how technology can support the future working environment. Yeah, I agree. And 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 now we can see there are more uh, words coming into to this word cloud. Um, Katrina, there's one here which is uh, interesting and probably also more in your area around the level of trust. Um, there was something about trust here. I can't seem to find it right now. It, it, it works, it jumps around. Oh, it's at the bottom now. Employee trust of leadership or lack of trust in, in parentheses. Uh, could you comment on that, please, on how you see that? Um, yes, uh, it's, it's of course crucial to make uh, the use of technology in the workplace successful is that the employee trusted uh, and that the leadership also in their regard just also include, included in a, a trustworthy manner, uh, which I also echo uh, Jos's uh, consideration on, on being, you can say, human-centric, you can say employee-centric, that will uh, support the, the trust that you, that you don't get across this creepiness where you can really develop a lot of tools and technologies and make use of a lot of data connected to, to employees, but, but it's, it's the purpose and the human-centric approach that provides for trust and that's 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 key you need to to keep the trust in the organization yeah yeah thanks uh, and 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 just call it, calling on you uh, Brooke also uh, is there anything in here that you can see sort of resonates well with what what the work that you're doing with Schneider and 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 the technology setup that you're working on um, I think for sure, uh, and I think this gets into some of the other uh, proposed questions we have, but I mean, when we think about, let's say, the increasing prevalence of, let's say, uh, vaccines and um, effectiveness of those, you know, uh, I think it's just the question of, like, not needing, I, I guess we'll get into the first question, but I, I think trust and transparency are key, um, and, and giving people the confidence with information that they didn't have before uh, to come back to the office with uh with certitude and helping them know what's happening in a way they didn't have information previously. Thanks, and 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 yes, but just to to you know, uh, you're very specialized in especially in audio. Uh, is there anything here that also resonates with with sort of the E plus approach and 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 our ability to sort of you know, concentrate and and have good audio experience as part of the the, the bigger workplace experience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I can also echo what, what just said about uh, the technology. Technology is just an enabler. It is not uh, the, the mean in itself to, to bring that to the to the customers. And uh, and uh, we need to see the uh, how the, the, the employees has uh, has changed their behavior uh, during the pandemic, but also during the post pandemic. And that has uh, made some significant changes into our technology roadmap. So for sure, 
uh, this this uh, thing about uh, technology and how it, it is uh, enabling people to work smarter and better and, and more efficient without being fatigued over a full working day. Uh, because now they start to work in different um, in different places, uh, different uh, time zones, uh, different uh, environments, and that puts a, a whole new um, set of challenges to to the device uh, the devices that we need to to provide for the uh, efficient and and uh, and uh, and worker who still wants to have uh, uh, his well being intact. And and getting back to the rely reliability part, yeah, one of our uh, studies shows that that if you don't trust the device and the environment and uh, the, 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 the solutions that you're using when you communicate with peer-to-peer, um, -peer with, with colleagues and the business partners, then you stop using it. And uh, the problem is today with the solutions we have today, almost 95% of uh, people who is using uh, 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 web solutions like here today and devices, they have experienced uh, problems if you take that over one week. So there's huge uh, potential for improvement uh, in, in uh, getting things easier to work with. Thanks. And, and then, Nadim, uh, from, from your point of view, I mean, how, how does some of the previous things that you have heard uh, from the other panelists and, and some of the things that are on, on, on the screen now, how, how does that relate to the work that you're doing with, with, within the prop tech sector? Nadim, you are muted. Classic. <laughs> no, I, I think hugely. I mean, um, one of the things we very much experienced in, in the last six months or so is, is is a huge uptick in interest for solutions that can enable employees uh, post-pandemic uh, to both uh, be healthier, more productive, more efficient. But at the same time, the, uh, the, the, the companies and people that need to procure, procure these solutions, they don't have the experience. Uh, they haven't worked with technologies that that operate at this level, and uh, also an, another thing that I think is 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 very important here is that leadership has not been communicating very well uh, in terms of what are they going to do and how are they going to do it, uh, and I think that's really really important because on the one hand it goes to show that leadership don't know what to do, and on the other hand the people that they're trying to empower. Um, to do it, also need to have uh, more support from leadership and more autonomy in terms of um, acting out and, and uh, providing a bunch of new uh, solutions and, and, and avenues. Perfect. Well, thanks. It was uh, great just to, uh, to sort of launch a, a quick a Slido poll and a, and a question to, to get the panel warmed up. Um, what we'll do now is that uh, I'll briefly uh, introduce uh, the Delphi methodology and the, the, the thought of the method that was behind the survey that we did last year. And then uh, Jeff Saunders will present some of the key survey, survey findings uh, that were, came out of, of the survey. And then we'll turn it back into the panel for discussing some of these findings and, and conclusions. Uh, please keep your uh, mobile uh, handy or uh, the website that you used for the Slido poll because we have another poll uh, coming up uh, a little bit later that we'd like to get your input on as well. And also please uh, use the chat box um, uh, on, on your screen to post a question or a comment uh, for this. So, um, very quickly, um, just going in and, and talking about this, this uh, uh, Delphi survey, um, then the purpose uh, was really to understand how uh, COVID uh, is shaping our collective future and how to get a little bit of a glimpse how the future will look. Uh, we chose the real-time uh, Delphi approach to obtain a variety of diverse industry experts' perspectives on some of the key questions that we posed. It was a fairly comprehensive survey. It took uh, you know, uh, close to 45 minutes, actually close to an hour uh, to fill it out. And you could go in and reassess your question and change your views uh, based on uh, on sort of the converging uh, of the consensus view or the divergent opinions that you have. It was an online platform uh, that we used for this. But what it did, it gave us a, a sort of a curated view on some of the industry leading subject matter experts, uh, what they were saying and some of the key challenges that were facing the uh, um, the industry as such. So if you could go to the next slide, please. 
um, it was, uh, yeah, the next slide uh, after this. Uh, and then one more, please. Yeah. And then the, uh, the, 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 the experts were selected. Ne next slide. Yeah. The, the experts were selected through uh, our six communities of practice uh, from IFMA uh, that you can see on the next slide. If we can get to that, uh, there you go. Uh, so they were coming from workplace evolutionaries, uh, business consultants, IT, technology community, sustainability community, and, and so on that you can see here. And we invited 650 so-called subject matter experts, 250 of them actively were involved in the study and, 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 and provided input uh, to understand um, the uh, the conclusions that were derived for this. So again, the today's panel will uh, will discuss some of these um, conflicting views from the Delphi survey uh, within the headline of technology transforming the workplace experience. But before we jump into the panel debate, I would like to give Jeff Saunders about 10 to 15 minutes to share some of the highlights uh, and conclusions from the research. So with that, over to you, Jeff. All right, thank you, Peter, so much for for the introduction. Um, so we're going to be talking today about technology transforming the workplace experience. And, you know, I'm really excited that we have such a diverse panel here today. And one of the first things that we have to think about in the first rule of digital and innovation, digital transformation, the things that we've been experiencing for the last year is in the last several years is that technology changes very rapidly, um, but the organizations themselves change much more slowly. And I think that this is some of the things that we've been coming to terms with uh, under COVID-19, which has been a, a, a catalyzing effect, is that we have this big jolt. And one of the things I wanted to speak to is what Nadim raised um, in his comments as to the issue around trust and all the transformations that we've been seeing um, around the past year is that many of the organizations that we're dealing with come from different stages of development. So if you look at the next slide, um, we have a number of um, industries. And this was a study that was done by MIT and Capgemini that came out in November uh, of 2019, so right before the pandemic. And it was looking at how different industries um, were positioned in form in terms of its digital transformation capabilities. Now, if we look at the dark purple, um, um, dark purple bars uh, on the slide here, this shows the ones that were digital masters. That means that they were very well integrated in how they had their their leadership structure around the digital transformation of vision, um, how they were uh, working together in silos to and breaking down the silos to actually work together to achieve those goals. And what you see is a lot of differentiation between the different industries and sectors under analysis between some, not surprisingly, working in a high technology space that had a very strong um, digital transformation viewpoint, um, while others, particularly if you're looking at pharmaceuticals, who had a very um, weak or conservative um, viewpoint on the digital transformation agenda. Now, added to that is some of the challenges that the FM industry has faced. And these are studies that were done by the British uh, Institute for Workplace and uh, Facility Management. Um, when they did of their members, what they found was is that if you took a number of the technologies that we'll be discussing today, um, there were only two that, um, that facility managers were really aware of. And these were things like CAFM and BIM, Building Information Modeling. Other type of technologies, which we'll be discussing today, like cloud computing, um, collaboration technologies, artificial intelligence, the facility management uh, professionals were behind the curve. And so this uh, raises some fundamental challenges that, number one, all the industries are starting in a different position, and two, the facility managers um, are kind of struggling to catch up and to kind of say, like, how could they be a part of this transformation agenda? Next slide, please. Now. The pandemic, of course, catalyzed this adoption by several years, and we're going to be discussing how this is transformed. Next slide, please. So when we asked the subject matter experts to think about the technologies transforming the workplace experience, they actually focused on, we asked them to assess 22 um, technologies and how it would impact the workplace experience. 
And if we started looking at um, what they started answering, it was a dynamic question. They were actually um, able to append other technologies that they had thought would be able to transform the workplace experiences, and they appended 10 more. And what we see is the big one, everybody who's participating in this webinar and who has been through Teams and Zoom and all the other platforms that we have used, the number one winner was, of course, video conferencing technology, which was the runaway winner. Uh, but the other technologies that were quite close were the ones that would transform the experience, but the end user wouldn't be um, experiencing. These are things around... Um, uh, integrated workplace management systems, sensor technology, AI technologies that um, kind of are involved in analyzing and doing the analytics on what people are doing. Um, so these are these infrastructure technologies, which are quite fundamental for the transformation, but these are the things that that um, were, were the second group of technologies. And then, of course, there's these aspects around niche technologies, important for certain sectors, but not necessarily something that would be transforming all workers' experiences. And to give you some examples, you can look at much more detail in the report itself. These are things like augmented reality, which is what we have the image of on the slide here, um, additive manufacturing, so you think 3D printing. Again, niche if you're in the, in the innovation space or in production, but not necessarily a, a general technology that we're expanding the workplace experience. Next slide, please. Um, and so when we start thinking about these categories and what I love about the panel that we have today is we have experts and actually many of these technologies here to speak with us is, um, is that these categories uh, of technologies, they're very cross cutting. So we have this aspect around trust. Okay, we have a lot of technologies that have really expanded over the last year that's been in remote monitoring technologies. Of course, with how we manage the remote management of the assets that we've had, that's been accelerated by um, by the pandemic of giving facility managers the ability to assess the properties that they're managing, um, the flexible space, the apps, the solutions that people could use to book and plan and use different co-working spaces or book space at their offices, the Internet of Things, construction technology, data and analytics to help us make sense of it all, and the ways to visualize it. These are all the technologies that are going to be transforming in which the facility managers uh, today and in the future will be working more and more um, involved with. Next slide, please. Now, when we had, of course, this discussion um, back in the spring, we had this discussion around, okay, what is the transformation that we're going to be experiencing? And our subject matter experts, the majority of them, expected a shift to occur, um, this shift away from real estate, um, the physical, to the digital experiences that we're going to be uh, experiencing. Some, many of the panelists thought there would be a surplus in real estate, and of course they expected a, um, a transition in the classes of buildings that would be um, popular towards, you know, a shift towards lower class of buildings, B and C, less quality workspaces, and, and buildings over to a class A, the higher quality buildings, and that's something that we're going to be seeing. Um, they also saw, next slide please, um, a shift, um, of course, in an investment in AI technologies. And the ones who had a familiarity and a strong familiarity in technology thought this was going to be increased. Um, what we're also seeing is that many of the service providers um, that are offering technological solutions are integrating AI into their service delivery. So even if the companies themselves um, aren't investing in the technologies, the service providers that they're using are investing in these technologies. So we can expect an accelerated transformation in this space. Next slide, please. And of course, um, we're seeing this fundamental trans transformation. If you want to look at the last uh, experts assessment, we had a whole discussion around sustainability, and we're seeing these budgets for investing in the efficiency and improvements are also increasing. Next slide, please. Um, but some of the things that we're seeing in this total portfolio of spend that organizations are having, shifting away from the physical to the digital experience, um, shifting in priorities uh, in the types of buildings they're experiencing. They're also having to support a hybrid workforce. And so many organizations are expecting to um, be paying for the computers, the technologies, the devices, the audio um, devices, um, uh, the, the dual screens, everything like that to enable people to not only work from the office, but at their homes as well. And there's a lot of debate around uh, the other functionalities 
um, in the workplace experience. If you're looking for that, we had episode four, which we go into detail on that as well. Next slide, please. But the aspect which is quite interesting, which is this, again, comes down to a trust issue. And I think that's something that is gonna be coming up in many of your workplaces, is this aspect around workplace monitoring. And there's multiple facets we can get into on this topic, and I'll touch briefly upon two of those. One aspect is the aspect around health. Um, many um, organizations are doing, um, particularly in North America and in Asia, are doing remote thermal energy, imaging, seeing if people have fevers or not, facial recognition about who's supposed to be there, logs or badges that buzz workers to let them know they're violating social distancing norms that they're getting within two meters or a meter and a half or a meter, depending on the health regulations in the country. Um, but this is something that we actually saw a split in um, our subject matter expert panel, where 40% of, of, the, of the professionals were leaning towards agreeing with the statement that we will see more health technologies in the workplace, monitoring the well-being of workers as they work, and others um, not seeing that and in, in, in between not knowing. So this is something that's quite an interesting challenge. I'd love to have the perspective on the panel around how this is developing. Next slide, please. Um, one of the aspects which gets into the comments around trust and the lack thereof is this monitoring of productivity. And this is a conversation that we've been seeing increasingly. Uh, we put together a scenario that we asked to be tested where we created a, a, a scenario where we had this discussion of creating automatic monitoring systems of employees and judge them on equal terms and without anybody being disadvantaged. Um, the mechanism would monitor the productivity and evaluate workers against his or her colleagues and alert them if they're not performing and then you know, ultimately could terminate workers without any human involvement. Now, 58% of the subject matter experts rejected this scenario, um, but we're seeing signals or weak signals, if you want to use a foresight term, of this technology actually being rolled out in the workplace. Um, we have uh, you know, some reports pre-pandemic and actually during the pandemic of how Amazon was using AI to automatically um, assess and even fire low productive workers or atom automatically terminate workers who were violating um, the number of sick leave they had acquired, even though they're you know, you know, asking for leave to take care of sick family members and things like that during the pandemic. A challenge that's becoming um, increasingly um, difficult to deal with. Now, some of the aspects, next slide, please, that affect the aspect around trust in organizations, and particularly when we talk about remote work, where it's highly critical to engage um, in the trust of employees, is that the number of organizations, um, and this is a study done by SHRM, um, the Society for, for Human Resources Management in the United States, that um, asset, we're assessing their employees, uh, I'm sorry, their employers on how many were actually using passive tracking of remote workers to make sure people are working. So these are things like keystroke loggers, um, app uh, monitors to see how often you're switching in between apps uh, and programs on your computer. Um, in some even we're using webcams to take pictures of people to see if they were using and using facial recognition to determine whether people were um, concentrating and working or not. Um, and one of the things that we can see is there was a significant increase in the number of companies who are actually employing these technologies because there was a concern about could they trust their employees to work from not um, when they're working from home. So this is a key aspect I'd love to have a conversation about. Next slide, please. Um, and so these are some of these things which, you know, it's always interesting when you talk in the FM space and been working in this space for, for many years, is that uh, facial recognition in the hospitality industry is one of the... Uh, kind of canaries in the coal mine or indicators for change in the FM space. And while this may not be coming to you, the workplace near you, um, year one, year two, post COVID-19, it's definitely something that will be coming year five, year 10 for many of you. And these are the aspects around facial recognition and 10 out of, you know, eight of the 10 largest um, um, theme parks around the world are implementing facial recognition technology to go do away with the the bands that, for example, Disney had, where you could just click in and out of rides and amusement parks and things like that, just by your face, you'll gain access to certain parts of the park, be able to pay for things that you'd like to have, um, and is being very tuned to the individual um, person visiting the park. So is this something that could be coming to the workplace near you? 
there's already some companies who are, are testing out different models for deploying this type of technology. Next slide, please. So one of these things, um, these new challenge, uh, challenges and the technologies transforming the workplace experiences require integrated solutions. And when we did this study, um, FM professionals and the workplace professionals that we were pointing, uh, were pointing to the entities within your organizations who should lead this transformation. And they all pointed to the HR profession as the primary leader of the transformation agenda and the workplace strategy agenda, obviously um, guided by the inputs from the CEO office and others. But when we see further studies, next slide, please. Um, when we start seeing these challenges of aligning these digital and physical experiences and the digital transformation agenda, of course, there's organizational barriers and a silo mentality um, that occurs. There are challenges around varying levels of technological maturity around departments, fragmented data initiatives and ownership and things like that, and different investment priorities. But one of the interesting challenges, and this was looking at a study done by the UK um, Human Resources Network, their biggest human resource network is, what they found is that even though we think from a facility management space that HR should be leading the workplace strategy and transformation agenda, um, HR was actually the department that was least likely to be involved in the digital transformation agenda in, in organizations. So that poses a number of challenges. And this is a question that you should be asking yourselves. How is HR um, and the different entities within the organization actually aligning and contributing to the transformation agenda in your organizations? Next slide, please. So many of these uh, transformations are going to be occurring. Technology, as Jesper said, is a tool for transforming this, but um, we'd like to hear um, how this occurs and what deeper alignment HR and IT um, are providing to this. So with that, I'd like to turn the word back to Peter and he could lead us through the uh, panel debate. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for this great overview and, and, and thought-provoking ideas. Um, before I turn it into a panel, I do believe we have another poll question. Ashley, if you could bring that up, um, just to 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 have you know uh, activate our audience and also uh, see if we can we can get some some input on some of these key uh, issues that that Jeff raised. Um, yeah, if you could go back to Slido uh, as as some of you did in the beginning and. And type in the uh, uh, the number, the key uh, word here, or the the uh, the, ident the identification number for the for this Lido poll. Um, then we'd like to hear from you in terms of the investment in technology in in FM over the next twelve months in your organization, uh, and how how that will sort of pan out. Um, let's let's keep this open for a little while longer, and and then while while we're getting some of that feedback. Let's turn it back to the uh, to the panel, uh, and um, I want to start with with you, Jesper. Um, if we talk about collaboration technologies, which has been so critical during the lockdown, and and uh, and and in working from home, uh, these uh, these two hundred and fifty experts that Jeff was uh, re referring to identified collaborations technologies to be the most impactful on the employee experience. What collaboration trends are you seeing at EPOS, uh, and and uh, what kind of what trends should we as workplace uh, speci um, specialists what should we be aware of? Uh, what's sort of coming down the pike at the moment? Well, <clears throat> I would say the, the the most the most important thing that we've learned over the pandemic was that the meetings has been moved outside the meeting rooms. Uh, so we need to create a, a new way of uh, of meeting up. Uh, and that has challenged uh, the uh, the, uh, the different technologies to a, a huge extent. Uh, when two people uh, historically uh, need to have a meeting and they need to concentrate, they stepped into a meeting room because then there uh, was the quietness and the uh, ability to focus um, because they are sitting in the in the same room without being disturbed. Uh, during the pandemic. Um, People has been working from anywhere, uh, anytime, uh, with or without a video. Uh, and it also means that in order to have an efficient 
conversation and collaboration, you need to be able to make sure that you're not disturbed with a lot of unwanted sounds uh, during the meeting. So, and that puts a lot of, of pressure on, on the on the devices and and the and the uh, technologies that you need to apply to enable to have an efficient meeting. It could be uh, when uh, I could I could have the meeting from my car, maybe or from home uh, with my annoying kids uh, yelling in the background. Uh, uh, we need we are, we're getting we are, we are, we need to get used to uh, to all these uh, very annoying surroundings, and we need to clean up technically. We need to clean up the signal uh, when two people have a dialogue. So the people, uh, the person who's sitting in a very noisy environment, uh, there's two challenges for that person. The first uh, challenge is that he needs to make sure that unwanted noise is not disturbing him or her who is sitting in the meeting. And we can do that with um, removing background noise by using a pair of headsets like uh, Jeff uh, is uh, using, uh, where there's a, both a passive and an active uh, damping of, of the uh, surrounding noise. But what is also important is that the, uh, the receiver of the communication, uh, the person you're talking to, uh, do not pick up all the unwanted noise that you have uh, in, in the same environment. So what we're working with is uh, optimizing the own voice pickup so when uh, Jeff and me, for instance, are talking, I have a small headset on here. That headset I can use in very noisy environment because there is an uh, acoustical beamform in the headset and that combined with artificial intelligence, we can filter out all the background noises, which is not relevant for the conversation. If I can illustrate it very fast, you can see here, I have a small uh, same side of headset that I has on now. And here we have, Three microphones located in an array. Those three microphones, we know when that points towards the mouth when I'm wearing the headset. So I want to enhance all the sounds that comes in that direction. So if I take out my headset now, I can see that I, now I'm pointing the microphones directly uh, like it was sitting on my ear. But if I turn the headset uh, 180, you can hear that it's just my voice. you can hear that the sound comes back. That means that when I'm using the headset, it is only enhancing uh, the, uh, the, the sound centimeters away from the microphone array because we have optimized it to add with a microphone. And now you can actually... <laughs> uh, this, by having these, uh, uh, these technologies, that will enable us to move the meeting outside the meeting room and still have a very efficient meeting because you can continue the uh, the conversation without being disturbed by all the surroundings that you uh, that you have so that was just a, one example of what what the technology can bring and again technology uh, for the uh, same yes but i'm going to uh, uh, i i appreciate the input and the product demo but uh, i'm going to stop you here <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise okay. we go into a, an audio discussion but but brook uh, brook uh, picking picking up where 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 Jesper left off. I mean, what are some of the new end user experiences we can expect within the next two years, two to three years? I'm muting. Uh, so again, when we think about going back to the workplace and this whole notion of things like health checks and whatnot, um, I, I would say to that earlier point, those are probably going to be in decline. Um, I think that as we see more effectiveness of vaccines, more confidence, uh, it's more about things that are going to help enable efficiency in the workplace. So people will be able to use their phone to badge in um, to a building with a mobile credential. And that's as much about convenience as it is about, let's say, a touchless experience, which is very popular when you hear people talk about that today. Um, I also want to point out there's an opportunity to use other technologies, such as, for example, easy to deploy sensors to capture data around things like indoor air quality, you know, CO2 to humidity levels, uh, or things, for example, around people flow and area counting um, to, to support use cases around wait times for amenities or condition-based cleaning. You know, and the key thing here is as you capture these data, how can you then deliver the insight to the employee as well as the real estate team so that everybody more formally is informed and feels more confident about what's happening in the space? So the way you deliver it could be through a web portal, through a mobile app, but again, a cultural shift around the transparency of information gathering and sharing, which drives trust and effectiveness in the office environment. Excellent, thanks. Um, 
and, and another question. Oh, yeah, sorry, yes, you have you have yeah, a comment. Peter, yes. Peter yeah, can, can I add to what Brooke is saying? I think that Brooke is, is mentioning a lot of technology related to measuring and analyzing data. But I think what he's missing is that new technology will come up to uh, increase the collaboration between team members. Because now you don't know if your team member is remotely, he's in the office, he's working at home. So where is my team? So new technology will come up to support the team in, in the collaboration. And not only in analyzing data, no, but to be proactive, proactive to, uh, to manage the collaboration uh, between team members. Yeah, Nadim? You're muted. You're on mute. Yeah, I, I think it's go. a super interesting discussion. One of the things that we spend a lot of time on discussing is there's so many great technologies and solutions out there, be that, you know, solutions from from uh, these larger solutions like like um, Schneider, Plan On, and so on and so forth. But what we're really seeing is how do we uh, minimize friction between the building itself and the users mm -hmm. experience and mm -hmm. the productivity that they need to be doing at work so mm -hmm. so we really spend a lot of time in saying how can we transform the building to become uh, not just an enabler of um of better of of better experiences at work but actually a contributor to more productive uh mm -hmm. workflows in general so mm -hmm. a, a, a super lay example of that would be you know, take something we all know today is you need to book a meeting room. Uh, today, that is actually a lot of steps. When you think about it, you know, you need to schedule it. You need to invite people. You might need to order things uh -huh. like uh, coffee or food or so on and so forth. But in a, in, a, in a frictionless reality, that is saying we need to book a meeting and automatically a flow yes. starts where – all of the people that need to be uh, summoned for that meeting are pulled in based on their uh, historic experiences of what they like to eat or what they like to drink. That's right. automatically booked. They locate the meeting room that is uh, relevant for the amount of people that are there. Um, the temperature is aggregated to based on their historic settings and so on. So it's very much about saying, how can we bring those two worlds together yeah. and enable a productive workforce, both so that they are you know, have better experience, but also so that we're minimizing the amount of, of friction that they need to go to so that they can do what, what's actually uh, best for them and their organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good point. And also to Yoss's point before, we have a comment or question from, uh, from the audience here. Elise Verhagen, what thoughts do you have for businesses with a split between people who can work, work virtually and people who must remain on site how can we eliminate eliminate the gap between these two groups anyone who want to comment on this well i think yeah i yes, think uh, yeah i think that the gap the gap uh, this is this is where technology can can uh, can 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 make a difference uh, because if we if we can uh, if people can have a meeting room without being in the meeting room uh, this is this is where we want to to, to bring uh, the meetings of the future we can see that's not only with uh, audio, that's also with uh, video. And then, of course, the building uh, that, that is the workplace needs to support that. So it going, going, uh, going uh, peeking into the future, you can see that, um, that uh, people will be working anywhere from, uh, from anyhow. If we ask our, uh, we made a survey where we asked the people around uh, globally, it turned, almost 90% globally has worked from home for a longer period of time during the last, uh, last year. And 50% of those, they would like to continue to do that, mm -hmm. not to the same extent, but maybe one or two days a week. It means that the, the, the meetings, the way we meet uh, together uh, going forward will change. Mm -hmm. And that, that on top comes the whole climate dis discussion about flying. And so, so mm -hmm. meeting uh, without being in the same room is uh, here to stay. But, and that brings me to uh, uh, another question uh, to Katrine in terms of data ethics and and the, the whole sort of surveillance society that we are entering into. What recommendations would you provide to an organization to make sure that they are applying the technologies that we are talking about here in the most ethical and beneficial way, uh, both 
for the employees, but also for the for the organization itself. Yes, yeah, so that's that's really a big question uh, that is uh, that that might take a bit long to to answer in full. Um, but I mean, I would like to I would just like to quote uh, the the former. Uh, head of data protection with eBay a long time years ago uh, when he said to me that, uh, that that I could see him as the white knight or the or Darth Vader. Um, and I actually think that quite easily sums up what we are seeing in the in, in use of technology that 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 you can be seen as a white, you can be seen as an enabler that also Nadim is, is talking about. Technology can enable employees and, and production and businesses to to, to do good. But there's also a dark side, and we need to to kind of talk about and address that when do we cross that. Um, I would also like to bring in um, another person who, who I think is is has kind of also sum up of, of the consideration that that organization needs to do, which is is the former, but unfortunately also the late European Data Protection Supervisor Giovanni Buttarelli, who who said in 2018 that that what is legally possible and techno technologi technologically feasible is not necessarily morally sustainable. Mm -hmm. So we need kind of a, a moral compass in that and the organization needs to implement measures that, that can identify when are we crossing the line? What is the line actually? When is we crossing this part about the gap between people working from home and, and working uh, uh, on site? That requires management, requires requires leadership and new competences in that. But it also requires this focus on when are we crossing the creepiness part. I think that that the the answer that HR is very important for this. Mm -hmm. I I can just applause this because um, that that make brings in the, these considerations <laughs> on what is actually morally sustainable, or also from a human centric and also especially transparent. And trustworthy um, approach. Yeah. Thanks. So that was Nadine. my consideration. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, Nadim, uh, you have you have a comment to Katrina's? Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think. I mean, it, this is one of the things that we get a lot. We when we showcase all of these fascinating solutions to 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 different workplaces. You know, one of the things that come up is. Uh, what about security? Are they going to track me when we go uh, to the toilet? Right. Um, and what we've actually come to realize is that there's also a generational question here. Uh, you know, the, the further you go up the ladder of age, uh, these questions become prevalent. And at the same time, the, the lower we go, the, the more active uh, the, the younger generation we experience are at saying, well, actually, we don't mind sacrificing data. We don't mind sacrificing privacy if that means that we can be more productive, more efficient, and thus actually winning more time. You know, in, in my workplace, I have young kids or young people that are at university and they actually talk about how they can productivity hack their day uh, in, in terms of maximizing time spent at the office, time spent at school, and then going out there and getting the most out of their life. And they're willing to sacrifice um, the insights that they have or that they give in order to do that. So I think it's a it, it, it's going to be a really interesting discussion in the long term how, how this plays out. All right, uh, uh, I just want to go back to the because this is a big topic that we can discuss and 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 but I just want to call uh, the the poll and and the results from the Slido poll we did just uh, 10 15 minutes ago uh, if we can get that up. So. Uh, uh, let's see here. So the 37% uh, uh, think there's a it will increase significantly by more than 10% the investments in technology within the FM space. 26% uh, say it's marginally, and then 26% also say it's uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's an increase between five to 10%, and then the rest is is uh, it will either decrease or stay the same. So, Jos, uh, you're, you're a consultant in this space. Does this input surprise you, or is that also what you're seeing from the marketplace? No, not at all. Not at all. I think that that uh, that organizations they will uh, they will invest in technology, and they invest in in space and and, and in real estate because uh, less people will come to the office. But I think the, the challenge is 
the challenge is to invest in the technology that really supports, again, I'm going to repeat it, support the collaboration of the teams. Because uh, technology as facial recognition, maybe it's turning back what we achieved pre-COVID with clients of us for 15 years in trust and in collaborating together. And now you say, I'm going to measure how you're looking today. Maybe you are drunk yesterday night, so you're not productive today. Maybe you had sex with my wife, so what's going to happen next? So this is, this is in my perspective, it's turning back 20 years in history. Yeah, uh, Brooke, you have a comment? I, I would focus on uh, that the investments are going to be around in the immediate near term, fine tuning the real estate portfolio. Uh, we're actively doing this at Schneider today, you know, across 30 of our global sites. How are we understanding true uh, metrics around occupancy utilization so that we can then fine tune um, the, the space we're actually paying for, you know, with mm -hmm. leases? But um, there are other things too we can use these data to understand is how do you want to redesign, repurpose the space? We've been talking a lot about collaboration. I still think having been home now for 14 months, working, you know, Peter with the plan on team uh, very intensively the last several months, uh, things are lost with remote, uh, you know, remote collaboration and meeting. There is nothing to take the place of being there in person. I even mm -hmm. remember with the, uh, the the telepresence facilities that we had in the mid 2000s were very much popular, the virtual conference rooms. Those mm -hmm. kind of seem to go by the wayside. So I think there's still nothing that's gonna take the place of meeting in person and then using technology again to refine the real estate footprint and then redesign the space so that it's, it's purpose built for that in a more intentional way. Mm -hmm. The space that you do keep and have. And, and then I think that also brings on a question that we saw here from Laura, uh, Laura Morgan. Uh, has anyone found that IT departments are moving forward without involving FM teams in some of these workplace technologies that we are seeing? Uh, any of you have any experience from that side and, and that the whole notion around collaboration, bringing your <coughs> colleagues in from different departments uh, within the business? Yes. But that it's also what, what Jeff mentioned when he was saying yeah. that, that uh, facilities management uh, a sector is not adopting new technology, but it has, and he mentioned Kaufman and BIM, and those, those two technologies are connected to the building. Most of them are connected to the building. So I think it has to do with also with, uh, with the position of the facility management manager in the organization, where you should stand up and say, okay, I'm focused with the human beings. I'm focused with the workplace experience. And then he needs to get or to talk to the IT uh, to the IT manager to look for an integrated approach. And and I'm, I saw clients where IT department was just implementing things, and I and the facility manager was not aware of it. So it's uh, I think it it's the case today. But it has to do with and and I think panel discussions like this and what IFMA was doing with the study, I think can improve also the knowledge and improve the position of the facilities manager in the organization so that he really can also connect to the IT department and get involved in this type of projects. Because he is also connected to the other components in the organization and he should really be part of this, this type of projects. I would just add to that, that we are seeing, oh, sorry. Yeah, we're, we're seeing certainly these task forces being multi, you know, cross-functional. So we're seeing, you know, FM, real estate, HR, IT, uh -huh. all working together. Um, I think it's a necessity because all those elements and, and capabilities are part of the, these, these outcomes. Uh -huh. Yeah, Katrina, you have a comment as well? Um, uh, yes, so I think there's, there's, there's questions around the involvement of various um, departments, IT, uh, facility managing HR and so on, but there's also involvement of, of the employees and also the management. Um, how, how do we, what, how, what framework do we establish to actually, to make sure what, that everybody knows what is, what is going on? And, and it, this, this differs very much between types of companies, sectors and so on. You will have uh, tech companies who will be very uh, easily mm -hmm. accommodated by using all these technologies. And then you will have the production facilities or the, um, the garbage man uh, who simply doesn't need ha have the abilities to really grab what is going on. And, and in the employment relationship on the workplace, there is a, an unbalance in, you can say, in power. Uh, I, I agree there's an age thing, but there's also a social thing. And we need to kind of accommodate that, that everybody can be included in the workplace, even if 
their backgrounds are different, their educations are different, and and so on and and so forth. But and that is that is something that is that is going to be challenging to. That's a gap that we need to 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 close somehow. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm sorry, I have to close the debate now. The time is up and we're at the top of the hour. I just had to turn on uh, off an alarm here. So it's six o'clock <laughs> in Denmark uh, for some of us. But um, but thank you so much for your input in the panel. We could have continued this discussion uh, for a long time. It's it's a really it's some really interesting uh, topics and it's it's really highly relevant uh, for, for the industry at the moment. So thank you so much to all the panelists for joining us uh, today. Thanks to uh, Katrine, Jos, Brooke, Nadim, Jesper, and of course, Jeff. Uh, and thanks to all the participants for your questions. Um, join us again for the next uh, IFMA webinar soon. And also uh, be aware that there is an early bird registration for the IFMA's World Workplace in October in Orlando, Florida. So I hope uh, some of you will be able to join us then. You can find all the episodes and a ton of material uh, on the IFMA Coronavirus Resource Center at our the IFMA website. So watch this space as we communicate new webinars and, and new conferences uh, in the future. So with this, I will once again like to thank all the participants um, and, and, and the panelists, and I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Hey, thanks so much, Peter. And yes, incredible discussion. Thank you so much to all the panelists and to you, the audience, for attending. So please be sure to like the video, hit the subscribe button in our YouTube channel. And as Peter said, we'll be back with more great content coming up. You can also go over to ifma.org and pick up a copy of that experts assessment uh, research report for more information on that. Thank you, everybody. A great session. Thank you.